May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. But you know, I wish more people would <laughs> would do what you were doing, which is drinking life in and, you know, just observing. There is too much expression and no experience. Yes, you're absolutely <laughs> right. And what do you say to people who... <laughs> who who need to listen, who need to drink life in a little bit more. Human experience happens from within. Pain and pleasure is generated from within us. Joy and misery generated from within us. Agony and ecstasy generated from within us. But we are thinking something else is doing it to us. So the more and more I looked at it, I understood the mechanics of how what we call as human functions from its very core of non-physical dimension to the physicality of who we are. As I observed it more and more, I realized various things. One day I was like around seventeen or eighteen at that time. Food was... Uh, uh, no, I don't call this a eating problem, but I ate a lot. I never put on any weight because I was so intensely active all the time physically active in sport, in climbing rocks, riding motorcycles, or at that time I was riding a bicycle endlessly. So one day I put my... a morsel of food in my mouth and it exploded in my mouth. I suddenly realized something that is not me, coming from somewhere, suddenly is becoming me. Within my mouth, not even... it didn't even go into my stomach, right here, it's just becoming me. That's how it's happened, isn't it? It just hit me so hard. Suddenly, I started eating slow because... not by choice, not by wanting to be slow, suddenly the experience of eating became like the greatest thing because something that's not me, it is no more about taste, it is about something that's not you, is becoming you. This is the greatest love affair happening within myself. Mm. It just exploded. Like this, it went on and uh, by then, uh, I had become a super skeptic about everything. Skeptical about social situations, moralities in the world, uh, religion, politics, economics. I'm super skeptical about everything. Then I started a few businesses because I was crisscrossing India on my motorcycle. Then they stopped me at the borders. I was nearly twenty, but I did not know there is something called as a passport, you know, that's another generation. They stopped me and said, uh, where is your passport? I pulled out my driving license because I've been riding since I was twelve without a license. By the time I got eighteen, within three months, I got my first driving license. Well, I thought my driving license is like, will take me anywhere in the world. These guys stopped me at the border and said, this is not going anywhere, you need a passport. So I did not know what it is, where to get it from, I came back, figured it out. Within six months, I got a passport because I thought I'm going to just ride away across the world. Then I knew I need some money, so I started a business, I started a farm. I built a few farms for others, then I got into construction, became far more successful than people would normally think you would happen... would happen in a short period of time because I'm... I'm like eighteen, twenty hours a day non-stop. Okay? <laughs> Others work eight hours a day and they stop in between, they have to smoke, they have to drink, they have to eat, they have to rest. <laughs> I have no such issues, I'm like on. So naturally, everything worked. And uh, my mother started saying, oh, you know, somebody told me that when you were born, that you will live a very fortunate life. I said, I'm the one who is working my ass off and you telling me somebody told you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told you I'm fortunate, <laughs> do you know all the circus I'm going through? Yes. To produce results on the surface, do you know all the circus that happens inside? <laughs> yes, I do know that feeling. I felt... <laughs> I, I actually had an experience where I went to a church convention and... when I was younger and 
someone had prophesized over me and said the same thing. And now I kind of feel the same way. I mean, <laughs> I'm working so much. <laughs> Thank you. And, and it, it is a privilege, but it is hard work, isn't it? It depends. If you do it joyfully, True. it's exciting. If you do it miserably, it's hard. Yeah. No work is hard unless you make it that way. Would you say that changing your perception is the key? See, if you're joyful, you will swim up and down twenty-five times. Well, is it hard on your muscles? Yes, it is. But is it hard? No. Is it hard work? No, it's joy. So you climb a mountain, is it hard? Yes, your knees will freak, but you're accelerated. So how can you call it hard work? If you're doing something that you don't love to do, then only you can do hard work. Hard work, you must leave it for donkeys, because donkeys are always made to do what they don't like to do. Unfortunately, poor animals. How do you encourage someone to find the joy in their life, and specifically their career? Because if they do find that it's hard work, how do you help them shift their perspective? <laughs> See, somebody was telling me that it seems some studies are showing Seventy percent of the Americans hate their work, mm -hmm. hate, not dislike, mm -hmm. hate. If you're doing something that you hate for five days of the week, mm -hmm. of course in the weekend you will overdose. You should not do that because this life is not about you making it hard and then in the end having fun. Mm -hmm. This is not what this life is about. We live in this world that teaches us that we have to work, 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 paycheck to paycheck and then uh, someday we'll have a happy... No, it's not about paycheck to paycheck. Right from kindergarten level, oh. always you must be ahead of everybody else. So because your only joy is in other people's failures, if we do not change this, humanity will never find joy. Above all, nobody will find joy in their work. There is no such thing. Because both joy and misery can only happen within you. The seat of your experience is within you. It's not out there. So it doesn't matter if you sweep the floor or you are a rock star or I'm a spiritual teacher, it doesn't matter. You can do everything joyfully if you're joyful. Work is not joyful, activity is not joyful, nothing is joyful. Only you can be joyful. If you are joyful, everything that you do will be like that. Now I'm not driving a Mercedes or a Ferrari, I'm driving a truck. But I'm joyful <laughs> I'm driving a truck, boom, boom, diesel. Is that what is parked outside? Yes. <laughs> wow, I have to go take a look at it. Yes, I'm you so must excited. See it. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you, you know, you in your bio, it, you are an Indian author, a yogi, a mystic, and a visionary. Can you describe what a mystic is for people who may not know? <laughs> he, See, there are only two kinds of people. This happened uh, some time ago. Uh, you know, the books, till now, most of… I have published about hundred and twenty-three books. So, most of these books are just compilation of my talks. Somebody transcribes it and puts it, I never bother to read it, usually I give it a title. Amazing. Only these last three books, Inner Engineering, Death, and now the karma, these three books, I've sat on it and worked a little bit on it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're just talks, people compile and put it on. Mm -hmm. So this particular thing came to me, I just flipped through and uh, then I wrote the title of the book of mystics and mistakes. Then our English publication department, uh, because we publish in various languages, uh, came back and said, Sadhguru, this is too much up in the face, you can't just say of mistakes and mistakes. I said, see, there are only two kinds of people in the world, mystics and mistakes. <laughs> wow. Those who have made a mistake with their perception, they are mistakes. So much suffering happens because of that. If you perceive everything right, people will call you a mystic. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody could be a mystic. Of course. Wow. I love if it that. Is, Thank you. If it is uh, so unattainable, that means uh, I must be some kind of a alien. Okay, so I do have to ask, speaking of aliens, do you believe in extraterrestrial beings? Well, I'm talking to you 
<laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> Ananda Tirtha, out of his own device and deception, he devised it in such a way that he will always be in Gautama's physical presence. Gautama warned him, this is not good to fix up life like this. You are fixing me up like a wife would fix her husband. Because Ananda Tirtha, being Gautama's elder brother, before he took his monkhood, he put a condition on Gautama. He said, right now I am your elder brother. I can command you to do whatever I want. But once I become your disciple, I will have no such power. So let me exercise this right. And now I am telling you, after I become your monk and your disciple, never should you send me away from your physical presence. I must always be in your physical presence. Never you should say, go there, do that, do this. Always you must keep me next to you. Gautama said, you are trying to fix me up like a wife. Never you should love anybody, never you should do this. This is not good for you. This is not at all in the interest of your well-being. But as an elder brother, you are asking me and if you insist, I will abide by this. But I am telling you, this is not good for you. Ananda said, it doesn't matter, but I must be in your physical presence. He stretched it to ridiculous lengths. This wanting to be in the physical presence of Gautama, he stretched it to ridiculous lengths. It came to a point where after eight years break, Gautama went back to see his wife, who was his wife at least, Yashodara. Yashodara is a very proud woman. Gautama, being her husband at that time, and Yashodara with an infant child, Gautama left the house without telling her in the middle of the night like a thief. He did that because he admitted that he did not have the courage to face her. If he looked her in the eye, his determination to go in search of truth may falter. If he looks at his, at his child, when the child is awake and calls him father, his longing to know may falter. So he left in the night. Now he is going back after eight years, a fully enlightened being. But he is sensitive enough to appreciate the emotions of Yashoda, how she would have felt and how she is still angry with what happened to her life. What happened to Gautama's life is fantastic. What happened to Yashoda is not a good thing. He knows that. So he is going there to see what he can offer to her now to compensate for what she has lost in his eight years. So it is a sensitive situation. So he told Ananda, this once relieve me from the promise that I made you. This is not for myself. For me, she is no more my wife, I have grown beyond those things. But for her, I am still her husband who deserted her without telling her, without giving a warning about it. So this is a sensitive emotion for her. She is a proud woman, it is not good for you to be there. Ananda said, you must keep your promise. Gautama bowed down and said, okay. And he took, her, took him there also into that situation. When Yeshodara saw that he has come 
with an assistant monk to face her. She just flew into your age. <laughs> Gautama knew this. He said, this once, relieve me of this promise that I made. This is nothing spiritual that you are going to miss anything. This is about my wife. But he said, no. Then, towards the end of Gautama's life, Gautama's work created many enlightened beings. But Ananda was still the same man. One service he has done for Aziz, he recorded everything, events that happened according to his understanding. But he recorded everything very diligently. So people asked, why is he still like this? So many people just came and met you for a moment and they got enlightened. They have transformed themselves in so many ways. But he is always sitting next to you and why is he like this? Gautama just said, a spoon cannot taste the soup. What you refer to as the guru is just a certain energy, a certain possibility. It's not the person. So the physical presence, is it important? It is very important. But the physical need not mean the physical body. The grace is not an airy thing. We can make it very physical. It's as physical as the breeze that you feel. It's as physical as the sunlight. Initially, when a person is just beginning to become receptive, being in the physical presence of the guru becomes very essential because your way of perception is only seeing and hearing and five senses. Because of this, you want to hold him in your eye, you want to hold him in your ears. This is the way you know he's there. Yes, it is a necessity in the beginning, but you need not remain there all the time. He will be very physical. Without any negativity, without any negative thoughts bringing down the intensity of the thought process, the first and foremost thing is, you must be clear what is it that you really want. If you do not know what you want, the question of creating it doesn't arise. If you look at what you really want, what every human being wants is, he wants to live joyfully, he wants to live peacefully. In terms of its relationships, he wants it to be loving and affectionate. Or in other words, all that any human being is seeking for is, pleasantness within himself, pleasantness around him. This pleasantness, if it happens in our body, we call this health and pleasure. If it happens in our mind, we call this peace and joy. If it happens in our emotion, we call this love and compassion. If it happens in our energy, we call this blissfulness and ecstasy. This is all that a human being is looking for. Whether he is going to his office to work, he wants to make money, build a career, build a family, he sits in the bar, sits in the temple, he is still looking for the same thing, pleasantness within, pleasantness around. If this is what we want to create, I think it's time we addressed it directly and commit ourselves to creating it. So you want to create yourself. One who is next to you right now is your neighbor. Another cosmos. Well, that's really easy. If you have to just one lump, one being, it costs life. Neighbor does not mean somebody who lives next door. Whoever is… whatever is right next to you right now, one who is next to you right now is your neighbor. If Jesus had said, love somebody who is in the other side of the planet, they would have loved them. 
Go in easy. Your neighbor, he is not good, isn't it? This moment, whoever is next to you, if you learn to love him, you will become loving by your own nature, isn't it? Yes? At this moment this person is there, another moment another person is there, next moment an insect is there, next moment somebody is there. If you just learn to love anything that is next to you right now, your nature will become loving. Loving means what? On the level of the emotion, a certain level of inclusiveness, isn't it? Love your neighbor is not easy, it needs transformation, isn't it? Something about you has to change to love your neighbor. To love God, you don't have to change anything. You can bullshit yourself completely. You can bullshit the whole world and still love God. This is just like these days, it's become a fad. Everywhere, especially I find the new age spirituality in the West has taken on this. Oh, I love humanity. I love the cosmos. Oh, that's very really easy. You don't have to love anybody. If you have to love one individual, well, it costs life. If you have to just one love one being, it costs life, isn't it? I love the whole cosmos, but I can't stand the person who is sitting next to me right now. That's a different thing. Now, this is just bullshit. Too much of it. Yes? I love the whole humanity. Where did you see the whole damn humanity? To love them. No, I just love. Yes, that's very easy. Just try to love one person and see what it costs. So much of you, you have to put it on the ground. So much of you, you have to surrender if you have to love just one person, isn't it? Yes? But I love the whole humanity. <laughs> this is easy. Someone said, love the neighbor. That's very significant, very significant. Oh, let me check who is my neighbor. That's not the point. Whoever is next to you right now, whatever is in touch with you right now, just to love it indiscriminately. The very air that you breathe, neighbor? Yes? Is it your neighbor? Yes. The water that you drink, neighbor? Sitting here, right? Hmm? Is he your neighbor? Yes. The land that you walk on, is he your neighbor? Just to know that whatever is in touch with you right now. Now, this is something else, it costs life, otherwise it won't happen. What is life? This is after sixty. <laughs> you should have asked this question when you were eight, <laughs> at least when you're sixteen. <laughs> sixty. But what to do, better late than never. <laughs> He asked. Then yogi <coughs> laughed and went into raptures. Oh, life… Life is like the fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze. <laughs> the bishop looked at him and said, what? Life is like fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze? Our teacher told us, life is like a thorn. <laughs> Once it gets into you, if it… if you sit, it hurts, if you stand, it hurts, if you lie down, it hurts. <laughs> what is this fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze, spring breeze? So the yogi smiled and said, well, that's his life. So this comes from the fundamental that when a human being clearly, experientially understands 
that entire experience of human life is created from within, never from outside. Right now as you sit here, do you at least see me? Even if you're not listening to me, I'm saying. <laughs> Can you use your hand and show where I am? Ah, no, no, you're getting it all wrong. You know, I'm a mystic from South India <laughs> Now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina, you know the whole story. Where do you see me right now? Within yourself. Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself. Where have you seen the entire world? Within yourself. Have you ever experienced anything outside of yourself? Right now, someone next to you, if they touch you, you think you're experiencing their hand. No. You are only experiencing the sensations in your hand. In the very nature of things, you cannot experience anything outside of yourself. When everything, when the entire experience of life is caused from within you, at least it must happen the way you want it, isn't it? Hmm? The world will not happen the way you want it. At least <laughs> the experience of living here within you must happen the way you want it. If… if… if your experience of life happened just the way you want it, how would you keep yourself, blissful or miserable? Please, you must tell me I'm going to bless you <laughs> Blissful or miserable? Blissful. For yourself, definitely highest level of pleasantness for yourself. What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, <laughs> but you know what you want for yourself, isn't it? Now blissfulness or pleasantness of life is not a goal by itself. It is only when you're blissful by your own nature. That means you determine the nature of your experience. No matter what is the situation, you determine the nature of your experience. Or in other words, you have no fear of suffering. Only and only when there is no fear of suffering, will you walk full stride in this life. Otherwise, it's always about what will happen to me, what will happen to me. Every step is a half a step. Now, this so-called spirit of Eastern wisdom comes from those beings who walked full stride, who determined the nature of their experience. The outside never decided who they are. So, they could walk full stride and explore the depths and dimensions of life that others never dare to touch because most of the humanity is only concerned about what will happen to me. What will happen to me means what? Will I suffer? That's a question. The first and foremost thing, if you truly want to explore dimensions which we are referring to as another dimension of wisdom or knowing is that first you must determine the nature of your experience. You have no fear of suffering. Only then, truly exploring human consciousness becomes a reality. Touching dimensions of intelligence which gives access to the entire universe becomes a possibility. I'm supposed to open up for questions <laughs> It's time you ask your questions, please. The population I work with that are in the verge of homelessness or they're addicts. If I tell them that it is your intellect and it's your perception and this doesn't exist, they will laugh at me because it definitely they exists. Must, because yeah. it's the dumbest thing to say. Right. So I wanted to know the spirituality that you teach, the spirituality that many gurus teach, how is it usable for someone that doesn't have food to eat and it's going to become homeless, and there's so many problems, especially in America. I mean, how do… of course I teach them resiliency, it's a different fact, but to… every time I want to open my mouth and use some of your teachings, I have to set back. Now, the first uh, problem is uh, that you believe in the teachings because this is the problem with the entire world they've been cultured in some belief or the other. This is what is significant about 
what is referred to as Sanatana Dharma or what is referred to as the Indian way of looking at things is, this is not a land of belief systems, this is a land of seekers. Never ever were anybody encouraged to believe anything. If you see anything that comes from that land, you will see it is all about questions, <laughs> never about a belief system. If you enter an Indian home, in the same house, five different people are worshipping twenty-five different gods and goddesses. They still not made up their minds, which is <laughs> an intelligence which is simply exploding into everything possible. If you are in rhythm with it, you will rise. If you are not in rhythm with it, it will crush you. It has no love, it has no compassion, it has no intention of helping you, it has no intention of harming you, it has no nothing. If you understand the forces and ride it, you have a fantastic life. If you do not understand, it will crush you. You've seen people doing surf boarding on the waves in the ocean. It is such a magical thing, just riding the waves. But if you don't do it right, if you go into the waves, it's like being in a concrete mixer, it'll just do that and it'll kill you. So one rides the wave, another gets crushed by the wave, that is all that's happening. The rest is all human interpretations. This is the first thing we have to stop, that we do not extend our thought and emotion to the existence. This is relevant between you and me. This is relevant between you and your family members. You love them, I love you, you love me, all this fine. Don't look up at the sky and say, I love you. <laughs> it will not say, I love you back <laughs> because it has no such need. It's pure existence. This is what you have to become. If you sit here, you are a complete existence by yourself. This is a full-fledged life. It does not need anything from anybody. It has everything. It is connected with everything in the universe. It does not need anything, but we want to play our games, okay? We can do all this stuff, but you need to understand right now, we are trying to extend our compulsions to the whole creation. It doesn't work like that. Existence is not trying to help you. You may be in tune with it, bingo, you are. Whether you got in tune with it consciously or unconsciously, somehow you got in tune. That's why Sankara said, Yogaratova, Bhogaratova. That means somehow you do it, I don't care. Your Shankara, Adi Shankara went to the extent of somehow you do it. You get it, man, that's important <laughs> How you get it, who cares <laughs> Sadhguru, I am constantly torn between my senior colleagues who are extremely skilled surgeons. Uh, Sadhguru, the, on the heart there are some procedures which are done by very few people on this planet. I'll, I'll give an example. I do an operation called pulmonary endarterectomy. That's the, the blood clots from the leg goes to the lung arteries and it clogs up all the arteries. So twenty, twenty-five years ago there was no cure for this. And once you're diagnosed, you're destined to die within a year. Today, people who are on home oxygen for two years, three years, you do the operation, they can go back to skydiving or they can go to scuba diving. That's the transformative effect. But there are only fifty surgeons, less than fifty surgeons in this world who can operate. And like this we have some of my colleagues who are extremely gifted surgeons. They are in their fifties now and some of them are constantly talking about retirement. Especially one surgeon who is extremely gifted surgeon who can fix any damaged valve. He is single, he has no other commitments. Every other day he talks about going to Banaras or somewhere and retire and I keep telling him that God didn't create him to retire and meditate. He has to be fixing all these problems. <laughs> So he gives me extension every six months, uh, Guruji. <laughs> so at the end of six months, the usual rigmarole starts, he talks about retirement and everybody is depressed in the hospital. <laughs> so how do you deal with this kind of people? <laughs> you 
you must… Uh, you must give him a one-year sabbatical with me <laughs> Yes, because uh, the… the need or the idea of retirement enters anybody's mind because of the monotony of what they're doing, whatever it may be. Somebody else may think it's a great thing, but in your experience somewhere it's becoming monotonous or stagnant. Stagnation is one thing that human intelligence and human system cannot take and most of the ailments are because of stagnation, stagnation of life. They may be… they may be getting their, uh, you know, once in three years promotion, they may be making little more money, all these things may be happening. But somewhere experientially there is a stagnation, which could be a major cause for many of the complex ailments that people manufacture within the systems. The more complex they get, you try to create more talented surgeons. I'm saying we are manufacturing the problems, we are trying to manufacture a solution. I think as we offer solutions, people who have already gotten into problems, they need solution. But it's very important that we teach people how not to create these problems. So that instead of fifty, you have to produce five thousand expert surgeons to attend to all these people who are on self-help to illness. So I would say a surgeon who's… Who, ha who has a certain competence and who has worked through his life, if he wants to explore something of his own nature, that would be the greatest thing to do because he's not a man without commitment, not competence. When competence and commitment is there, you should not run him through the regram role and destroy the possibility. It's important that he explores something of his own nature which will make him… we don't know what he'll come up with. You cannot even estimate what he may come up with. <laughs> But otherwise in every cell in the body there is air. So when you say air, it's not just the breath. Six percent air is in every cell in the body. Just remove it a little bit from the brain, it'll be good. It's good if it's in the lungs, in the heart, in the muscles. They function better if there is oxygen, you know? Do you know this? If you're oxygen deprived, muscles become rigid because this needs air, otherwise it will not work. So, water is seventy-two percent. <laughs> so maximum care should be taken about the water because it's seventy-two percent. If you are going to an examination, Suppose uh, it is like this, let's say you're going for physics examination. You have water, earth, this, that, but just the water subject is for seventy-two marks. Naturally you spend more time reading about water, isn't it? Studying water, yes or no? Air is only six percent. You may not study because you are okay with ninety-four. Water you must study because it's seventy-two percent. You must take enormous care about the water because it's seventy-two percent, still substantial, isn't it? So how food goes into you, from whose hands it comes to you, how you eat it, how you approach it, all these things are important. Then comes your air, six percent. In that six percent, only one percent or less is your breath. Rest is happening in so many other ways. And it's important, especially if you have children, at least once a month, take them out somewhere, not to the damn cinema, again breathing everybody's nonsense. <laughs> the air gets affected just by the sounds and the intentions and the emotions, all the rubbish that's happening on the screen, and all the rubbish that's reflecting in human minds of violence, of sex, of greed, of this and that is affecting that limited air in that hall in a tremendous way. So instead of taking them to the cinema, take them to the river, teach them how to swim, 
climb a mountain. Where is mountain Sadhguru? Himalayas is so far away. Even a small hill is a mountain for your boy. Yes? Even a little rock, just go climb and sit on one of them. Children will enjoy it immensely, they will become fit, you will become fit. And above all, your body and mind will function differently. And above all, you are in touch with the creator's creation, which is the most important thing. Not your own rubbish that you made, yes it's comfortable right now, but it's not everything. So instead of going to the restaurant, instead of going to the cinema, instead of going somewhere else like that, at least once a month, it doesn't cost anything. Huh? Doesn't cost anything. You can take your rice and aokai and go and eat there. Anyway you have it. You don't have to spend money on this. Even better, if you don't want to spend money even on the bus or car, all of you cycle, just three kilometers, five kilometers outside Hyderabad, sit on one rock, just spend time there, feel the sun. It's very important you get some sun, air, good water. Come back, you are doing Bhuta Shuddhi in a very natural way. It is not the ultimate type of Bhuta Shuddhi, but you are doing some Bhuta Shuddhi. This is what I was saying just now, if you take care of food, water, air is not always in your hands because you're living in a city. But water and food you can take care. And what kind of fire burns within you, that also you can take care. Sunlight has not become impure, isn't it? Get some sunlight every day, please. Get some sun on your body every day because sunlight is still pure, isn't it? Nobody can fortunately contaminate it. And what kind of fire burns within you? Is it the fire of greed, fire of hatred, fire of resentment, fire of anger, fire of love, fire of compassion? What kind of fire burns within you? You take care of that, then you don't worry about your physical and mental well-being, it's taken care of. Yes or no? There are joyful people and miserable people, but there are no good people and bad people. Mm, that's <laughs> big. <laughs> the, the moment we think we are good, we are entitled to destroy the bad, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we've been destroying a lot of people for a long time. Time to stop that <laughs> because Human beings are in different levels of experience and understanding, variety of people. Anybody who is not like you is obviously bad, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it so? Those who are not like me must be bad people. Because the basis of goodness and what you think is goodness is decided by you. No, you have no business to do that. Willing means this, I'm just willing. I'm a hundred percent yes to life. I'm not yes to this one, no to this one, no. I'm just yes and yes to life. If you are a hundred percent yes to life, you are a volunteer. Oh, that's you have become a willing life. You have become so willing that you have no will of your own. People ask me, Sadhguru, how do you operate with all these people? All kinds of horrible questions they're asking, they're doing this, they're doing that. I said, my life is not about them, it's about me. It's about how I am. It's about me. It doesn't matter how they are, that's their choice. But how I am is my choice, this is my way. No matter what they do, I'm like this because I have not given that freedom to anybody, that somebody can freak me, somebody can make me angry, somebody can make me happy, somebody can make me unhappy, these privileges I kept to myself. It's time you do that too, because if somebody else can decide what can happen within you right now, isn't this the ultimate slavery? Huh? Isn't this? Someone else can decide what should happen within you. What happens around you, of course, so many people decide, hmm? 
What happens around us is not hundred percent ours, but what happens within me must be my making, isn't it? Right now, just about anybody can freak anybody because they're not volunteers, they're unwilling. Volunteering means you have no will of your own, you can do whatever is needed. You know, we are a volunteer organization, this means uh, all kinds of people. <laughs> Most of them are not qualified for the jobs that they're doing <laughs> And I cannot fire them because they're volunteers <laughs> <laughs> so people keep coming up to me on a daily basis, they say, Sadhguru, I can't work with this person, she's so horrible, I can't do it. And I tell them, see, in this world, this is the sort of people who exist, like this, like this, like this, like this, this is the kind of people there are. But if you want to work with ideal people, you must go to heaven. And today, <laughs> and today. <laughs> but if you think what you're doing is very significant, you must learn to work with all these horrible people. This is how the world is. If you think what you're doing is very significant, you learn to work with all kinds of people. You will see horrible people will do wonderful things. Yes? Yes, yes. But if you want to work with ideal people, you won't find any, I haven't found one yet. <laughs> there are all kinds of mixed bags, yes. but <laughs> if you are willing that you are not yes and no, yes to one, no to another, you're simply one big yes, you'll find a way. <laughs> Thank you so much. That I, I, I always say that it's the resistance. <laughs> You can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. This is getting too easy, just sleeping sadhana. So coming awake to an alarm bell with a sudden start is not the best way to do your life. How many of you find uh, that one day morning when you get up without any reason, you're just feeling ugly for no reason? If it is happening even at least two, three times a year, if it is, then you must do certain things before you go to bed. It's very, very important because unconsciously, you need to understand this, you can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. Either pleasantness or unpleasantness, you can incubate very effectively uninterrupted in sleep. You can also incubate it in the day, but there are so many interruptions, it doesn't happen very efficiently. But if you have a tendency to go to bed in a certain way and you wake up in the morning really nasty for simply no reason, that means you're incubating things in the night very efficiently. Bad eggs. This is not just about psychological disturbances, it can cause major physiological problems over a period of time. It's, it's important that you eliminate these things from your life. So before you go to bed in the night, there are certain things that you need to take care of. It's best if you're eating meat and other kinds of meals, you eat at least three to four hours before you go to bed. The digestion is over. Before going to bed, drink a certain amount of water and go to bed. You will see it gets taken care of just like this. One simple thing can be just a shower, always to shower before go to bed, it'll make a lot of difference. In this weather, maybe cold showers are difficult, so you go for lukewarm showers, don't go for hot showers in the night, go for lukewarm showers, it makes you alert. So you will think, oh, I cannot sleep, 
it doesn't matter, you will sleep fifteen, twenty minutes or half an hour later, but you will sleep better because it will take away certain things. When you shower, it is not just the dirt on the skin that you're taking away. Have you noticed if you're very tense and anxious, whatever, just a shower, you came out and feels like almost the burden has been taken away from you? Have you not noticed this? So it's not just about washing the skin. A whole lot of things happen when water flows over your body. This shower is a very rudimentary bhuti shuddhi because over seventy percent of your body is actually water. If you run water over it, a certain purification happens, which is beyond cleaning the skin. I'm talking about attention not even about something, just being attentive. In the yogic systems, we have what is called as dashavadanis, shatavadanis. What this means is, a man will do ten things at the same time. Now, when you don't miss a thing, everybody thinks you're some kind of a superhuman being. We can give you very uh, dynamic processes through which you can scale up your attention to a higher and higher level. Visionary Women is a volunteer-run uh, organization and I know that every single person who is here is giving their time to one organization or another. And the fact that you have nine million volunteers, and you were talking about the relationship between volunteerism and willingness, and that it's through willingness that you uplift your consciousness, if I'm quoting you correctly or I'm understanding it. In some ways, talking about how it could be a doorway to becoming a bigger person than mm -hmm. who you are. See, uh, before we come to women, first thing is visionary. What a vision and vision means is, see everybody has desires. Desire is an incre incremental way of enhancing our life. Today you desire I must have a home, tomorrow you desire I must have this money, tomorrow you desire something else. These are incremental ways of arranging and rearranging our lives, mm -hmm. which are needed to do a few things. When you say I'm a visionary, what you're saying is, I have a larger desire, which is not about just incremental improvement of my life. Desire is about me always. Vision is an all-inclusive all process. So, this itself is a phenomenal thing. If people, instead of having desires, if they have a vision, mm -hmm. vision is always all-inclusive. Desire is personal. Desire leads to incremental changes and improvements. Vision can transform the whole situation. <laughs> I like music <laughs> So, uh, about willingness, because you said you're a volunteer organization, to be a volunteer, a volunteer means Somebody who is doing something willingly, right? There's no other compulsion. There are no financial compulsions, there are no social compulsions, there is no something else. You want to do something willingly. So when you're a willing participant right now, you're a volunteer. I'm asking all of you, right now, are you compelled to be here or are you here voluntarily? Oh, thank you. Because I have sp spoken to conscripted people also. <laughs> what means focus to you in, and which way can we apply focus in our daily life? So what's your definition of focus? Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree? that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference, there is… there are nuances to it. But when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man, 
because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I'm talking about, attention not even about something, just being attentive because… only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist, all that's happened is there is no attention, because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. He could not do his best because he couldn't handle the situations and the realities of life at the age of thirty-seven, what he should be. I think Messi handled that situation of his age gracefully and I think it paid off for him. And it's not all in his hands, the team and the situations, the opposition teams, many, many things are there. So if you want to see in the finals, is Bappe better or Messi better? Bappe is way better. He's playing like Pele, all right? But things didn't work. Things didn't work, he's only twenty-three. He's moving faster than almost anybody in the entire tournament, but couldn't win. In the end, that's all that matters. This is what you need to understand. What we are doing in our lives is not all ours. Many things are there. It's happened to you many times, you hit the tree but it went on the green. Oh, that's how you win <laughs> It happens. You hit… you think you hit a great shot but it bounced somewhere else. You hit a bad shot but it came back where it should be. Well, all these factors are there. So don't go looking for luck hitting the trees. No, you do your best. What happens is not all yours, that goes for even the best champions of champions, all right? No question. So it's not right at any time that you don't pose this question even to yourself, am I better than the guy who's sitting next to you? Don't do this. What is the best I can do, that's all.